So even if you are an awesome developer, you still will need to spend some money <laughs> and, uh, you know, because you can't do everything when you get to scale. And so that's what we've found. Um, at the moment with our active plugins, we probably spend, we probably have a pipeline of about 100 hours of, of stuff that we, we want to do um, and that we've scheduled in. Um, and so we have to pick and choose what's the most important stuff. So we've got, um, you know, someone comes along and they say, well, you know, I think it would be great if you have this feature or I insist that you have this feature, otherwise I want a refund. Um, we, it might be one, anywhere from one to 30 hours to make those changes. And we typically would spend, um, you know, 20 to 50 hours making a plugin from scratch um, for, for a typical one. So there's quite a lot of time involved. Maybe it costs me more because I'm not a developer. And so I need to pay someone else to do it uh, well. A second thing, uh, lesson for me, is definitely customer service. So when you start scaling it, there's going to be a lot of people who, when we've got 1,500 clients using your plugins, there's going to be a lot of people who have problems. And a lot of those things are not going to be your fault, but you still need to deal with them. There's a lot of people who have 50 plugins installed on their website. And when they install your one, it breaks the whole website, um, but it's kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. You know, it's not your fault. It's not your fault, uh, typically, but you will be blamed um, often. Uh, but also, because you might have a wide number of users with different versions of WordPress and all this kind of stuff, um, there's going to be a larger chance of something going wrong. So people are really keen to get uh, priority service every time. They are the most important person when they email or call you because their website's gone down and they assume that you will stop everything in order to help them. Um, so you need to sort of manage those expectations quite well. Plugin maintenance is also part of that, is that when someone says, I think it would be really great if you did this, um, you know, you've got to prioritise and think about what you should be doing, but make sure that it's better over time every time. Because if it's not better three months later than it was, then um, they're just gonna, they're, they can just go somewhere else and get it from someone else who's you know, got, a, got better stuff. Uh, the next point is about Git. Um, it's, a, it's a technical thing. I think the point with this is that there's always going to be something that's going to totally crush your soul when you're making these things, whatever it is. For, for me, it was Git. And just to sort of give a, a layperson's explanation, some people want to uh, have Git, um, everything uploaded through Git, right? And it, it manages the versions of the software and all that kind of thing. And I don't care about Git. I'm not interested in it as a non-developer. I just want to get our new versions of our plugins out there. Uh, but some of our partners required that you submit it through Git. And no one in our team seemed to be any good at this Git thing. And so what happened was is that we'd have a, um, you know, we'd have a new version of our plugins, and then it would be two weeks before we got it into the system because it was just such a hard thing. I don't know why. Now it's really easy, but at the time it was, it was super complicated. And, yeah, you know, we were getting a lot of pressure about why haven't you you know, you haven't done this properly, and it should have been really simple, but it wasn't. Um, so uh, there was a time when uh, one of our plugins was going to be removed because we just weren't keeping up with the customer service. We weren't following these lessons. Um, this was a while ago. Um, and, and there was a chance that one of our plugins would be removed from the marketplace because the customer service, as well as, uh, you know, there was new versions of WooCommerce and it just wasn't keeping up. So it was a real risk for us and gave us some real inspiration to up the quality of what we were doing, up our game, up our customer service. Um, and it was a really good lesson. So what is it that makes a successful plugin business? I think one of the cornerstones has to be recurring revenue. If you are selling something uh, for $25, which you only get once from that customer, it's not a viable business proposition unless you're selling thousands upon thousands of these things every month. 
So for us, uh, especially with the WooCommerce uh, side of things, um, recurring revenue is, is how we um, is what we center our business around for the for the plugin development. And uh, but what that means as well is that you can focus on improving the plugin for the existing users, improving the renewal rates as well, which I think is really important. And um, and your business starts to focus around that. And you get paid every month, which is fantastic. And you get paid more every month if you do it right. Um, I've already talked about customer service, but I do think it's really, uh, you know, really, really critical uh, because you have so many uh, potential customers and they will just go somewhere else. And especially if they haven't paid very much and they're not too price sensitive, they'll just buy it somewhere else and they'll ask for a refund straight away. So it might be that they buy it at uh, 10 o'clock this morning and then they don't hear from you about their problem installing it and they want a refund by three. So, you know, again, you have to manage the expectations, but you have to expect that. Quality, again, is really important. There are a wide range of quality in plugins, uh, as you may be aware. And so we have a team that they just do the plugins. They don't really do anything else. And that means for us that, um, that they really focus on that. They're not making websites and plugins. I think there's, there's a conflict there. Um, and, and so if it isn't great, it's not going to work across different versions of WordPress or WooCommerce or whatever system you're using. It's going to be less reliable, and then when you get to scale, it's going to have more problems. Uh, with WooCommerce, we actually, um, we actually d stop supporting the previous versions quite quickly because there's, otherwise it just becomes, you, you're spending 20 hours making your new version compatible with something from five years ago. Uh, I'm, I've got something here about um, the $10,000 versus the $500 plugin. So really what that's about is that there's a big opportunity here for customized solutions. So um, most of our business is actually from customizing our existing plugins um, or custom building plugins for our clients. A lot of the time people will say, oh, well, your plugin doesn't do this thing and I would expect it to do that and therefore you need to add it, otherwise I want a refund. Um, other people will say, you know, especially in the commercial space, they'll say, I want your plugin to do this, and I expect it, and how much is it going to cost me? Um, and so we do a lot of that, and that comes from building up a reputation over the long term. Uh, for the $500 plugin, we actually have a, like a plugin that we sell, which is $500, and it's actually really popular. It's popular because it's a high-value plugin, and we spend a lot of time on it. So... Um, you know, for example, that $500, you go, whoa, you know, I can get a plugin for 20 bucks. That $500 plugin, last year we would have, in November, December, we would have spent $5,000 improving it. So you sort of get an idea of, of what we're putting into it, but then we get the returns at the end of the day. And, uh, and so I think that, that for a business where you are selling plugins, that plugin is really a stepping stone to, to doing other work in the space. Um, I said here the big win, I think that, um, that, that by, and I've talked about this already, is the incremental improvement of your plugin over time, adding new features and functionality, will definitely um, increase the value of the plugin over time, because um, if you're not changing it, it's just not going to be competitive. And, and therefore, you increase your renewal rates as well. People want to continue buying it because they have a new version of WordPress and it doesn't work. It's been a year. They want to invest in it again. I think it's important to be aware of some of the complexities involved uh, when you are dealing with a wide range of customers. For us, um, we do uh, deal a lot in the financial space. So we have a, a number of plugins which are um, connecting to payment systems. We, uh, we do have to have some risk management in there. We are insured for financial uh, software development in the financial space. <laughs> so, um, so we're covered there. Uh, but I think you need to seek professional advice about that because the chances might be slim of someone coming to you, but if someone's really angry, then you know, it could be a risk. No, we might have fallen off the planet here. Just bear with me. I think this thing might have died. 
thankfully we have the right arrow. Um, so, so, um, so for business owners, um, what is your experience with plugins? Did you buy a $35 plugin and it saved your bacon and made things so much better for your website? Did you install a brand new plugin and your website went blank and was like that for four days while you tried to find a web developer to fix it up for you? Um, or did you get your web designer to make a plugin for you who was very enthusiastic about it, but they did a terrible job and it didn't work properly? I think that whatever your um, situation, there's something to learn um, about plugins um, as a business owner. My first advice would be definitely uh, using your web designer to make a plugin might be the worst thing that you can do. I have a certain perspective on it because we were those guys making plugins to start with and we weren't very good at it um, for the first couple of years. So um, having, uh, having someone who's uh, skilled at plugin development is really important. And I think you need to ask those people that you are getting those services from, oh, some batteries, perfect. Um, what are their credentials in making plugins? Do they make, actively make plugins? Have they ever made a plugin? Um, what's their experience with those things? I think that that's really important um, because especially if you are getting something customized, you need to make sure it's gonna be reliable and work and that person's gonna be around to you know, upgrade and improve it over time. Um, in terms of what makes a good WordPress plugin, I think it goes back to a lot of the things that I talked about before. Um, it's gotta be really good quality uh, for a start. Um, it's got to be um, made by someone who knows what they're doing. It's got to be con considering um, a, a bit of a range of, um, of versions of WordPress or whatever software you're using. Um, for, for WooCommerce, we do have to make it quite reliable because we, you know, we're an Woo official WooCommerce partner and we need to make sure that it's at a certain standard. Otherwise, we, um, we get in trouble or we could get in trouble. Um, and so, uh, so I think that as a business owner, how can you tell? Um, well, again, I think you need to sort of suss out who the person you're buying it from is. And sometimes at the end of the day, you just have to buy it and test it out. But test it out on a development site. Don't test it out on your live website because there might be a 3% chance that it breaks your site. But if you don't want a chance of it breaking your site and you want your site, you know, you your life to be stress free, then get a developer to actually test it first. And with a lot of our clients, like not for our plugins, but for other ones that we use with our clients, we actually uh, tr might try a couple of different ones. So even if they're like three or $400 each, we might say, hey, you know, let's try, it depends on the client, of course, but um, we might try a couple of different ones just to see exactly, they say that it does this, but you know, how good is it really? And does it do the job specifically that the client wants to do? Do and how, what's the quality of the code too? Because we don't want to build it for the customer, um, but, um, but definitely uh, we, we want to look at the quality. In fact, we had a, um, a customer who had like an advanced MYOB enterprise integration that they wanted to do with their WooCommerce store. And in that situation, we actually, um, they had from the vendor received a plugin. So it was already available. And the client was so concerned about it because it wasn't very good that we actually rebuilt it from scratch for them um, and also custom built it for exactly what they wanted. So they're like, we don't care that it's free. Um, we want something that is going to be sustainable and uh, reliable. Um, so in terms of setting expectations, what do you get for your money? If you are buying a $35 plugin, you will get you may get $35 of value, people. So, um, <laughs> you know, and especially if it's a smaller developer, they may not be spending much time upgrading it, so keep that in mind. Um, and also, if you have 100 plugins on your WordPress website, the chances of something happening are quite high, something bad, quite high. Um, you know, it's like, if you have a room full of 100 people, um, there's, people are gonna disagree on stuff, right? So it's like 100 WordPress plugins, there's gonna be problems. Um, and I think you just need to be aware of that and certainly professional advice can help with that. 
Some people ask, why is it so expensive to have one system talk to another when I want to make something integrate with a plugin? And definitely uh, a big part of that is about the fact that these guys made this software, another group of people made this other software. Uh, how easy they are to talk to each other might be com quite complicated, uh, but it's really about time to connect them, you know? And so you might be paying an hourly rate for someone to do that, so it does add up. Um, so opportunities for growth, I think uh, for us personally uh, as, a business, as a company, definitely these are our plugins on Woo. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with these other um, areas too, these other brands. And um, you know, even with our existing plugins, there's a huge opportunity for growth for us. So I think whatever you're doing, whatever stage you're at, there's always opportunity for growth if you are a developer. Um, and definitely for businesses, because WordPress and WooCommerce are so popular um, and they have such a massive fol following, there's always going to be someone who is in some way interested in making the plugin that you want. Um, so it's worthwhile spending the time to research options out there. Um, and, you know, like if you're thinking, oh, I can't really find what I'm looking for, get some advice on it or just keep Googling and you yeah, hopefully find something that's, that's good. Um, so that's it. So thanks very much, everyone. All right, time for questions. Please raise your oh. time for questions. So raise your hand, and um, I'll get you on the mic. So it's all recorded. So any questions? Hi, Chris. Chris Mundy here. Thanks for the great talk. Um, a couple of questions and thoughts and ideas. I thought maybe with your scope, if you put a scope statement up and what your, your actual plug-in does, then people, you can always refer that to them so you don't have any arguments. They understand that's the scope of what it does. So yeah. that might be something you might want to think about. Mm. The other thing too is that I used to work for a company and what they used to do was they used to charge organisations for their customised work, but then they would advertise what they actually did. Mm. And then if they had buy-in from other people, then they worked out a percentage of a refund over time. Mm. So it might be something to consider as well. Yeah, look, I think uh, the scoping part is really important. We are always, always making our plugins more clear because you can't be clear enough with people. There's always expectations about what it should do. Uh, and there's all, you're always going to fail in some respect with that. Um, with making custom plugins for clients, yes, there's always going to be demand from someone else, and so it's good to have an agreement with that customer. Uh, I mean, we would normally say, um, you know, have some sort of agreement, or we'll just do it for them, and if someone else asks about the same thing, then we might go back to that client and say, hey, someone else is interested, you know, could we give you a bit of a refund or something like that? So that always is, can be quite popular. I love questions, so. Oh, nice talk today. Um, how do you manage licensing when? Good question. So uh, with WooCommerce Marketplace, it's all managed, um, and they contact the customer about renewals, all that kind of thing, and we see what the renewal percentages are. Um, and uh, actually, the WooCommerce is covered under the GPL. Um, so with our own plugins though, uh, we work it a little bit differently. Um, we normally have like a 12 month license um, of validity. People can use it after that as much as they like, but typically people come back for a, a license renewal because we have a new version after 12 months, which you know works with a new version of whatever it is. And so that's normally how we do, do that. You were talking about customer support a little while ago. This is coming from a different point of view, but still kind of related because I do write some plugins. I bought um, a WooCommerce plugin for um, delivery of product. I forget what it was called. The plugin terms and conditions said if you add content to your website, the plugin will disable. 
So let's not go down the side of that too much. But at the end of the day, it left the. I spoke to the um, owner of the business, and it left. He said it left him vulnerable for probably about five thousand dollars a day worth of shipping expenses. Okay. It's a pretty serious matter, mm. and it literally disabled without notification or anything at any time of the day. It felt like WordPress was going to update, a plugin was going to update, you added content or whatever. So we, I had an all-out row with the developers over it. Mm. Um, they were nasty and aggressive. Mm. The question would be, from your perspective as a developer, there's an unintentional issue with the plugin. What do you think would be a reasonable turnaround time to resolve, given something like that, that it is a fairly potentially fairly serious issue for a customer? Yeah, I think that that's uh, a good question. The range of potential problems that you have with over 1,500 active customers is massive. So the, the unique situations with those people is massive. Every single person has a different collection of other plugins on their site, and those all interact with each other either in a negative or, or positive way. So it's really from the customer service perspective, it's about setting the expectations with the customer because we will have terms which say, we don't do this and we don't do that. But then also there's the realistic side that someone's gonna say, well, why did, it just doesn't seem, make sense that this doesn't work or whatever. You might have someone who comes and says, well, I've got this plugin and your plugin doesn't work with it. So I need, I've, my site's not working because of this and I need this done by 6 p.m. And for us, we're gonna say, okay, well, it's 3 p.m. and we've scoped the work. It's gonna take us about 20 hours to uh, make those, our plugin compatible with the other plugin. So we're not going to do that in the next three hours, um, but you know, it's about having a, an honest conversation. It's about communication is really important to have that back and forth and say, look, you know, here's the situation. We have this plugin, it does certain things, but it doesn't do everything for everyone. And you know, at the outskirts, you're gonna have people who are really disappointed about that and might be quite angry, but also we're running a, a for-profit business. So we need to decide and prioritize. And there'll be other people who say, well, this massive, really important plugin doesn't work with your really popular plugin. So that doesn't make sense. And we might be like, well, that doesn't make sense. So let's enable it. And then you open up a whole new opportunity. Um, but I'm not a developer. So what I find is that it's good to have sometimes non-developers who are skilled in the plugins to be liaising with the clients rather than necessarily having developers having that conversation. Uh, just further on the... Um customer service as well, um, there are people who um, uh, like to vent um, after sort of their experience of not getting what they want, yes. and they sort of vent in the form of a review, like a yep. negative review, um, even though sort of, uh, it's, it's an unjustified one, that's just their way of, um, of letting the world know and just a vent. How do you deal with those sort of situations? Mm. I think we, most of that stuff for us is internal, so we'll have someone complain directly to us rather than put it as a review. Um, and so I find that that's a really valuable opportunity for us to make amends, but it's about how we react to that and how we liaise with them. So they'll say, oh my God, you're so useless and you can't even do anything. And I emailed you yesterday and I expected this yesterday and there's all these, um, you know, all these problems with your plugin and so on. And so by managing that, we've got quite a lot of experience in managing people's problems. Um, so I think that that's really important is that experience. And so you do have to build that up. It doesn't come straight away. I was interested in your comments about interactivity between 20 plugins when, and the point at which they start interfering with each other. Mm. Is there a sort of linear relationship or is it basically, you know, if you've got 10, you're okay. If you've got 20, you know, it's, it's more difficult. If you get 50, it's impossible. If we make a website for a customer, we will have as little plugins as possible uh, because it, I suppose it, it's, um, it, it's more that the 
every single new plugin exponentially increases the chances of there being a problem. And you may have 100 plugins and you're fine and you're like, hey, I don't have any problems with my plugins. Why did your 101 one, 101st one muck up my website? Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I think it's, you know, it, ideally we wouldn't have more than five on any of our client sites. Any other questions? Do you communicate your roadmap to the public or to your, to your customers? I think that's a good question. Uh, we're not particularly proactive with that kind of thing at this point. Um, I think that if people were asking for it, then maybe. Um, most of the time it's more, does it work with a new version of Woo or WordPress? I think it's a really valuable point, and uh, I'm going to take that idea and run with it. Thanks. <laughs>